What does the Phantom of the Opera, the Duke of Buckingham, Peonies, and Booker T. Washington have in common? Están pasando tantas cosas. Another episode of The Gilded Age. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, of course, I'm coming to you all with another episode of The Gilded Age, Season 2, Episode 4, His Grace, The Duke. This episode is directed by Deborah Kampmeyer and written by Julian Fellows. So we open up this episode seeing Bertha giving the current patrons and sponsors of the Metropolitan a tour to witness its current progress. And of course, Bertha's favorite Newport neighbor is also there, aka Mrs. Winterton. We also see Mr. Gilbert taking everyone on the main stage and showing them that despite the work that still needs to be done, in the end, the Metropolitan Opera House will prove to be one of the grandest in the world. I'm not gonna lie, this whole scene right here, the whole setup with the chandelier especially, oh, it was absolutely giving me the overture, the opening scene of the Phantom of the Opera. I was honestly waiting for the music to start playing and for the chandelier to lift and for the Metropolitan to suddenly be in its finished, completed glory. But of course, that just means I've seen the stage musical and the film way too many times and I'm not ashamed to say so. We then see Bertha speaking to Mrs. Winterton, and we find out that she is there because of a letter that Bertha has sent her. While Mrs. Winterton cannot deny the splendor of the Metropolitan, she also recognizes that her husband's box at the Academy is far too valuable to give up. When an artist for the Daily Graphic asks to make a sketch of Bertha for the paper, she learns that a Newport newspaper is currently touting gossip about her son and Mrs. Blaine. While Bertha manages to skillfully circumvent the conversation, Aurora, who was also there, makes it clear that Maud Beaton has observed the same thing regarding the two's chemistry with each other. If that isn't bad enough, matters are further complicated by Mr. Gilbert's confession that the money meant to support the construction of the Metropolitan has officially run out. So it is now up to Bertha to come up with a solution to save the Metropolitan before it's too late. We also see Reverend Forte holding a meeting at Agnes and Ada's home to support the missionary work of Bishop Riley. Maud Beaton is also there, and she is quite impressed when Oscar decides to make a donation to the cause in her name. We then see Marion at the mother-daughter tea with Francis, and she has an awkward run-in with one of the attendees who assumes that Frances is Marion's daughter and that Marion is Mrs. Montgomery. The awkwardness only continues when Dashiell arrives and Frances feels the need to emphasize what a nice, neat little family they make together. We also see Miss Barnes requesting Marion's assistance with the charity classes led by Jane Addams, an activist dedicated to social reform. Considering that these teachers are in place to help students learn special skills, Marion is the perfect candidate for the position. Next, we see Larry and Mrs. Blaine, aka the current subject of the gossip column. Mrs. Blaine informs Larry that his mother has written to her and asks for her to call upon her the next time she's in New York. While she assumes the visit will be regarding her taking a box in the New Metropolitan, Something tells me this conversation won't end well, especially when Larry and Mrs. Blaine profess their love for one another. Speaking of Bertha, we find out that her inquiry into the Duke of Buckingham's lodgings has borne fruit. What's more, after writing to the English chairman of Cunard, Bertha and George have now been invited to a reception featuring the Duke. She also mentions the current issue plaguing the Metropolitan and asks George to look in on it. She also realizes that between managing Gladys' social life, quelling rumors about Larry, and also contending with George's betrayal, there are far too many fires that she has to put out at the moment and no one else willing to step in for her. However, 
we do see Bertha as she manages at least one of these fires very quickly and efficiently. And by that, I mean taking the time to kick Mrs. Blaine to the provincial curb, as it were. She does this in no uncertain terms either, emphasizing that Mrs. Blaine cannot give Larry an heir while also making clear the toll that the many years will take on their relationship in the future when Larry is in his prime and she is walking around on a stick. In many ways, it'll be a role reversal, considering the dynamic she had in her marriage with her late husband. Offended and frustrated, Mrs. Blaine finally departs, but not before learning that the boxes in the Metropolitan have um, conveniently been filled. Sadly, it's evident that Bertha's words have had a grave effect on Mrs. Blaine. We then see her finally break things off with Larry, much to his dismay and heartbreak. He was absolutely certain that this was the woman he was going to marry and build a life with. But as it turns out, this was simply a fling. And now it's time for both of them to move on with their lives. Easier said than done. Next, we see Ada and Reverend Forte having an outing at a park, complete with the peonies that he has selected for her. While she is grateful for this gesture, Ada can't help but worry about what Agnes will say. This is very apparent as she hands the flowers off to Marion once she arrives home. But despite the rain shower that she has just escaped from, it's clear that, as always, she has had a very, very enjoyable time with the Reverend which apparently will continue when the Reverend asks Ada to sit in on choir rehearsal the following evening. We see Marion informing Ada and Agnes of her new volunteer work, and Agnes just wants to know when the teaching of these beggars will begin. I said, no, ma'am, absolutely not. That was so disrespectful. And Agnes is equally put off by the fact that, along with Marion, Ada has plans that will keep her from joining Agnes for dinner the following evening. Despite Ada's protest that her relationship with the Reverend is mostly platonic, <laughs> Agnes is not convinced. In fact, she may be realizing that, much like the bee buzzing around the flowers on the dinner table, there seems to be a very unexpected and unwelcome nuisance that is now invading her life. Next, we see Watson discussing his current dilemma with Church and Mrs. Bruce. While Watson has no problem agreeing to the terms technically, he also has to know that this is something his daughter does want. And so, Church suggests that he write to his son-in-law and meet with him concerning this very issue. Said issue only intensifies when Mr. McNeil informs Watson that he and his wife will not be able to meet. But as Watson informs him, this is something he must hear from his daughter and no one else. And despite the veiled insult that Mr. McNeil attempts to hurl his way, Watson makes it very clear that his daughter's happiness is always his ultimate priority. There's also an interesting moment where we see Mrs. Bruce on the Russell's piano, and she's interrupted by Monsieur Baudin slash Borden, <laughs> who then proceeds to ask if she would be willing to accompany him to an opera concert in Central Park. Which she is. Now, I kind of figured something might be up or, you know, maybe slowly, you know, burgeoning between them when I saw them give each other this look during the impromptu concert at Bertha's event. It's definitely too soon to say, but it's kind of giving me Anna and Mr. Bates from Downton Abbey. I don't know. Uh, we'll just have to see. We then see Peggy and Mr. Fortune officially arriving in Tuskegee, where they are greeted by Booker T. Washington himself. And since I am all about my history, especially for these recaps, for those of you who don't know, Booker T. Washington was an American educator, author, orator, and advisor to several presidents of the United States. Between 1890 and 1915, Washington was also the dominant leader in the African-American community and of the contemporary black elite. He was also one of the founders of the National Negro Business League in 1900, which still remains in operation 123 years later as the National Business League. And I know I've said it plenty of times and I will continue to, 
But just watching this aspect of the show, it just makes me so proud. It makes me so grateful. And it just, to think of the legacy, you know, like to think of the community and all the things we were subjected to and the fact that we pushed for change, pushed for equality, like kept pushing forward in impossible circumstances. Because I sometimes think about it, I'm like, I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how you guys dealt, like, I don't know how anyone dealt with the things that went on during that time. But there were so many leaders and people who were pushing forward and saying like, no, we're not gonna just be stuck <laughs> like this. We're not just going to be chained and kept down. We're gonna keep pushing for change, for growth, for upward mobility. And, um, and just the fact that those contributions were made. And so now I can sit here as a free black man, you know, who can do anything and be anything he wants. <sighs> yeah. Um, there, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's honestly beyond words. Thankfully, Peggy and Mr. Fortune will have plenty of words to share with Mr. Washington and his wife at their home where they'll be staying. Later, during dinner, they discuss some of the curriculum that's available at the school that Mrs. Washington also teaches, which includes dressmaking. As a result, the students are able to create uniforms that they also sell, creating revenue that then goes back into the school. It also trains many of them for higher paying domestic work, just in case some of them cannot land a teaching job. Unfortunately, Mr. Fortune is ill at ease with what the curriculum seems to be lacking, particularly in teaching these same students to demand their rights and their equality. Mr. Washington is not blind to this, but considering the circumstances, it is his choice to make peace with the white community that has also brought forth considerable changes. But as a former slave, something Mr. Washington also has in common with him Mr. Fortune cannot understand making peace with people who bought and sold them. Peggy insists that the two men want the same thing, but that their two methods simply differ. It's a messed up situation either way you look at it because we are dealing with forces that, or were dealing with forces that were out of our control. And pretty much everyone was trying to do the best they could to just make change and move forward in the best way that they could. So I agree with Peggy in that, like, they they want the same thing and it makes sense, but the perspective and the understanding of it is just very, very different. Even though they're both right and neither one of them are really wrong. We then see Peggy waking up early to discuss a new angle for the article that she'll be writing with Mr. Fortune but then she has an awkward run-in when he opens the door half-dressed. Hold up, what's going on? Okay, okay. Now, let me say something really quickly. You guys know I try to trim these recaps down so they're not too, too long. And <laughs> in one of my last recaps, there is something I observed, but I cut it out because I just figured, oh, that's not really necessary. But now... <laughs> with this scene, I am going to go ahead and reinsert that because I have some thoughts. Now, if you guys recall in, I believe it was episode seven last season, it was the New York Times illumination episode. I mentioned that there was something I was a little worried about <laughs> as far as Mr. Fortune and Peggy because it seemed like they were bonding and that might've been spilling over maybe into something romantic, but I knew that around this time he was supposed to be married. So it was just like, uh, but they have a discussion about it. She's aware of that. So maybe it's not what I thought. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's the end of that. The circle's back around. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to feel about that. But for now, they understand each other. Peggy's on assignment and he's happy to have her around professionally. <laughs> So I may have to take back what I said because I can't say for sure, but usually when there are scenes like this where there are like these run-ins and, oh, I'm sorry, mm, it usually is a moment that adds to the growing attraction between two characters, which is clearly a problem because he's married, <laughs> which I was aware of last season. And if you see, you know, that recap, I kind of hinted at something, but I didn't want to give it away because now that's being spelled out. But I just, mm, it's looking kind of suspect to me. 
But anyway, Peggy does come up with the idea to speak to the students personally and away from Mr. Washington so that they can detail their experience at Tuskegee from a personal perspective. And in the end, the experience ends up being a fairly rewarding one for both the students and the reporters. We then see Mrs. Astor speaking with Mr. Winterton to discuss what is clearly <laughs> a very difficult topic. Having learned more about Mrs. Winterton's career, she realizes that she may not be entirely happy at the Academy. What's more, she will not find the other box holders congenial when they hear of this information. While the conversation is making Mr. Winterton quite incensed, Mrs. Astor is playing it cool. And in no uncertain terms, she's making it clear that the Wintertons will be surrendering their box at the Academy. Mr. Winterton warns Mrs. Astor that his potential journey to the Metropolitan will involve him taking as many of his old friends with him as possible. He also mentions that this is likely something that neither of them will forget in the future. Yet and still, Mrs. Astor is unmoved. Next, we see the reception for the Duke of Buckingham, where George and Bertha have just arrived, much to the frustration and irritation of Mrs. Winterton. Score one for Bertha. <coughs> Apparently, the good times keep on rolling for Bertha as she learns that work is now resuming on the Metropolitan. And on top of that, Bertha also does some quick maneuvering with the uh, place cards on the table and this also means <laughs> that despite being the first person to actually greet the Duke, Mrs. Winterton has unexpectedly lost her treasured seat next to him. Score two for Bertha. <coughs> Let me also say that this dinner table is probably the biggest I have ever seen. And it is so wild to me to think that it was a common occurrence. It's like, look, we're going to have like these big old events. We need a table that's going to seat everybody. So it's just, I was like, <laughs> I was like in awe. Man, I just, history is something. Mrs. Winterton's night gets significantly more interesting when she runs into Oscar, of all people. <laughs> it seems that Sweeney Todd and Mrs. Lovett have come a long, long way since last season. Speaking of which, Oscar is longing to hear of Mrs. Winterton's ascension. Ironically enough, Mrs. Winterton is relieved to be near someone who actually knows her whole story. Now, I don't think she thought about whether this could be a good thing or a bad thing, but hey, <laughs> in the meantime, we'll just stick with the good. And what is also good <laughs> is Bertha and her smooth maneuvers with the Duke. She manages to convince him to stay at her home in Newport as opposed to the Wintertons and to be an honored guest at the dinner party she plans on throwing. Besides, surely the Wintertons will be relieved to be robbed of their promised guest. My, 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 my. Score three for Bertha. <laughs> Matters don't get any better for Mrs. Winterton when her husband confronts her regarding the issue of the rescinded Academy box. Of course, she isn't bold enough to tell him everything about her past, so she simply says that, as she had no money at the time, she was once the paid companion of Mrs. Russell. Mr. Winterton may or may not be buying this story, but he also doesn't think that Mrs. Russell could have known that Mrs. Astor would react so badly. Really now. Also, I want to say something really quickly. I do enjoy putting certain actors and actresses, directors and so forth on blast when I recognize them. And in this case, the actor who portrays Mr. Winterton is none other than Dakin Matthews. And I am familiar with him because of his roles in The Fighting Temptations and Desperate Housewives. I also found out, because I didn't know this, but I found out that he was also the voice for King William in The Swan Princess. When it comes to the core childhood memories and the films and television and all that, 
I have, you know, a, a definite appreciation for people who contributed to that in any way. So the fact that not only was he, you know, a part of all these films, but also the fact that he is 83, his career is still thriving, and I just love the fact that he is playing a significant part in this series. We also see that the backlash against George is steadily increasing, including a satirical cartoon in the paper, not to mention the impending strike. Mr. Clay informs George that they have the fences around the mill, as well as enough scabs to keep production moving. Said scabs will make their way into the mills, protected by the governor's militia. But if the workers show up armed themselves, the outcome could be devastating. We then see the Reverend and Ada at choir rehearsal, where the Reverend informs Ada that the Duncans have offered him their box at the Academy of Music next Tuesday. He also asks Ada to join him to see the opera Aida, a tragic love story. But this isn't the only request that the Reverend has. Before he can forget his nerve, he expediently asks Ada if she will marry him. I think we can guess the answer. Elsewhere, we see Agnes finishing her dinner alone. We also see Bertha informing her husband that the plans with the Duke to stay at their home in Newport is now official, which means that their dinner party will now be the talk of the whole town. But soon enough, the subject shifts to Mrs. Winterton's former actions that have now created a considerable distance between the two of them. While George once again asks for Bertha's forgiveness, she makes it clear that there will be none for him should another situation like this arise again. And with that, the dynamic duo is once again united. But when the New York Times reports on the Duke's upcoming stay with the Russells, Mrs. Winterton is beyond incensed. What's more, she plans to get the best of Mrs. Russell if it's the last thing she ever does. Ah, I suppose such are the perils of dukedom. Yikes. And that closes out episode four, His Grace, the Duke. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> yes, the... The shenanigans, the drama, the complications, they continue on and on. Honestly, there's not a whole lot more to say because the episode really speaks for itself. But I'm, I'm telling you, I did enjoy the first season, but this second season is giving me everything that I need and everything I didn't know I needed. It didn't think I was going to get. So yes, uh, kudos to everybody involved. I'm excited. Let's get into episode five, okay? And as always, please feel free to drop down below in the comment section and let me know your thoughts regarding this episode and my recap in general. So, once again, this is D Movie Man, signing off, and I'll see you with the movie.